Tom, you can start. Okay. Uh, good evening and welcome to Tamil Heritage Trust's uh, monthly heritage talk uh, for July 2023. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, for those of who, who are new to Tamil Heritage Trust, THT, as we are called, uh, was set up uh, quite some time ago in 2010 uh, with the objective of understanding, appreciating, disseminating, and importantly, celebrating India's rich and varied uh, heritage. And towards this, we conduct a number of programs, uh, the chief among them being this monthly heritage talk itself, which happens on the first Saturday at 5.30 p.m. online uh, every month. Uh, we also conduct an offline program here, which is hybrid, uh, which is in Tamil, uh, which is in the third Saturdays of every month uh, here in Chennai, where we are based. Uh, in addition to this, we also conduct uh, a, a, a two-day seminar uh, in the month of December. It's called Techi Kacheri, as it uh, uh, coincides with the Kacheri or the music season in Chennai. Uh, the last one was held last year, on the topic of Vijayanagara. And... Uh, uh, in addition, we also do the Indology Seminar, uh, Indology Festival, which is an online uh, one week long festival. So we recently concluded the uh, Indology Festival for 2023 on the topic of Sagara Sangamam, India and the Sea, uh, where uh, over seven days, 14 expert speakers uh, spoke about the fascinating 3000 year journey along India's long coastline uh, to discover the influence of Indian trade and religion and spread of Indian culture across the ocean. Uh, all our talks, uh, events, lectures uh, are available in our YouTube channel, uh, and uh, we request you to go there and subscribe to the channel as well as click on the bell icon to receive notifications of, uh, of future events. Uh, it's free, and you can watch it at your leisure uh, whenever you have the time. Uh, we also conduct workshops uh, uh, here in Chennai, uh, and we also conduct an annual site seminar where a larger team uh, prepares to visit a certain uh, monument or a city or uh, a place of importance, heritage importance and historical importance, and visits them uh, both uh, with everybody uh, playing the role of both the student and the teacher uh, at the event. Uh, the uh, uh, PhD Professor Swaminathan Heritage Award uh, was instituted uh, in 2020, and uh, over the last three years, it's been awarded to an individual to recognize exceptional individual contributions. Uh, to the areas of uh, heritage and preservation as well as dissemination. These were the winners over the last three years. But the nomination process for the award uh, uh, actually ends today. Uh, and uh, this year's award, the winner will soon be announced over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, quickly to tell you about upcoming events, on the 15th of this month, we are giving away the second uh, V. Venkaya Epigraphy Award. Uh, this is for the year 2023. And we are uh, really proud and happy to say that uh, uh, a leading Kannada epigraphist, Dr. P. V. Krishnamurti, has been selected by uh, an illustrious jury as the winner of this year's award. Uh, the award ceremony and the lecture uh, will be on Saturday, uh, July 15, 2023. It will be held at the Arcase Convention Center here in Chennai, but will also be available online for those of you who would like to watch it. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti will also deliver a talk on Kannada inscriptions in Tamil Nadu on the occasion. And uh, we are delighted uh, that Sri N. Gopal Swami, IAS, the former Chief Election Commissioner of India, has kindly uh, uh, accepted our request to be the chief guest and give away the award. Uh, on 16th Sunday, we have the next edition of How to See a Museum workshop. Uh, it's a full day workshop uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, we start the day with a few lectures on iconography and related matters that will help. Uh, an individual appreciate the nuances of uh, one of the best museums, especially in terms of bronze and uh, stone sculpture galleries in the country. Uh, so those of you uh, who would like to join, uh, you can register at bit.ly at slash hausam. Uh, uh, we still have a few seats going uh, for this event. Uh, very shortly, we will be launching the, we will be opening for fresh enrollment, the Alamar Ravai uh, uh, Teachers for Heritage Program. Uh, a new session will start in August, and we will be uh, sending out invitations for uh, schools and teachers to nominate themselves into this program uh, for those who are interested in setting up a, a, a vibrant and fun heritage club in their school. We would like to welcome them to join uh, Alamaravai uh, program. 
Uh, to join our mailing list, please uh, write to admin at tamilheritage.in uh, at any time. We come to today's uh, event, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome Ramesh Gauri Raghavan uh, to speak on the topic of ancient games and what they teach us about uh, modern people. Uh, Ramesh, uh, as he describes himself, uh, is, a, is, a, is a polymath of sort. He is a marketer by profession, a scientist by training, an epigraphist by choice, and a poet by night. He's director at Ion Pure Tech Private Limited. Uh, he's the editor of a literary journal, Narrow Road. He's a member of the editorial board of Cafe Haiku. Uh, he has uh, uh, multiple publications on the literary side. His literary publications include poems, short stories, haiku, in several magazines and anthologies. On the academic publication side, he has, uh, his topics span ethno-archaeology of the Bene Israel, uh, ancient board games, archaeology of ballistic weapons and fortifications, and so on. He has taught Buddhist archaeology, he has taught epigraphy, manuscriptology, linguistics, archaeozoology, Dravidian linguistics, and so on at various institutions at the University of Mumbai Center for Extramural Studies, KJ Somaya Institute, the Institute in Trust, Mumbai, uh, uh, the M. Shah Mahila College of Arts and Commerce, and so on and so forth. Uh, he has organized the Distilled Images National Conference. Uh, which is on Haikai uh, literature. And with the Institution National Trust, he has uh, uh, conducted the National Conference on Ancient and Medieval Indian Games, about which he'll be speaking today. He's organized the explorations in Maharashtra uh, workshops and brought out and helped bring out the publications uh, in connection with those workshops as well. Currently, he's coordinating the diploma in Buddhist studies at the India Study Center Trust in Mumbai. Uh, uh, this is a publication uh, on which his talk today will be based. Uh, he is the author of in Ancient Indian Board Games, uh, uh, which uh, 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 he published along with the Center for uh, Extramural Studies of the Institution Trust, and subsequently a conference which was held in 2019, the proceedings of which were also edited uh, by Ramesh. Uh, uh, true to his uh, multifarious interests, so he is also the author of uh, books as varied as Gloves, uh, the history of uh, the prehistory to the pandemic, uh, as well as Jewish art of resilience and so on. So uh, we really have a, a person of wide interest uh, who's done specific work in the area of ancient games. And so we're pleased. Uh, he's also uh, uh, given uh, TEDx talks, uh, uh, and we welcome uh, Ramesh Gauri Raghavan. We thank him for uh, thank you, Ramesh, for accepting our invitation. We look forward to your talk on ancient games. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite a lot of detective work on my uh, CV. I Usually people request for a short CV and I'm happy to share that. Uh, so let us start with uh, what I call archaeopisology. Uh, let me go back to the initial screen. OK. So this is a word I invented. Uh, Paizo is the Greek word for play, and archaeo is the word for old. So the study of ancient games is archaeopaizology. Okay. Now, games are, are an essential aspect of our humanity. If we did not play games at all, we would probably not be human. Right? Uh, you know, there is the saying that all play and no work makes Jack a dull boy. But I think the reverse is the actual truth, that uh, while work is necessary for our sustenance, it is play uh, that really makes us human, that, that makes us uh, transcend our mundane needs, as, as, the, as you would see in the uh, famous uh, Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, you know, once our basic needs are achieved, we need something for the mind, we need something for the body, and that is where play comes in. Okay, so why do we study games? And if that is a question you're going to ask, then I'm going to ask the counter question, why study anything at all? Okay, it's as important to study games as to study anything because they, in, a, in many ways, tell us about who we are as a species. What I found very interesting over time is that humans are the only species that play games. Okay, now don't be mistaken. Almost all social animals 
play. Okay? All mammals are certainly known to play. But we don't make up rules while playing. That is a very uniquely human thing. Whether we're playing sports, whether we're playing board games, whether we're playing card games, we make up rules, right? And then we enforce those rules while playing. And therefore, that marks us very distinctly as a species compared to all other species. All, almost all species play. I mean, you've played with puppies, with kittens, right? Uh, if you, I mean, some people claim to have played with alligators even. So play is a very important aspect of life. But games are something that is essentially human. You don't see, you see chimpanzees playing, you don't see them making up rules. But what do we do with these rules? Like what on earth are we making up these rules for? And people have questioned this and there has been a lot of psychological as well as psych philosophical work on why, how games evolved and why we play games rather than just, just free form play. So if you see babies, if you see real young children, they aren't playing as they're making up rules. They just play. Right? That's why babies are given a lot of toys. We, we, we sing nursery rhymes to them and so on and so forth. But as children grow, they start making rules, you know. So they start running about, but at some point they, they, they turn that running into a race. Uh, they, they play catch, they play blind man's buff and so on. Things happen. What is interesting is that until the industrial revolution, play was something that was also common to adults. And in many societies that have not been touched by the industrial revolution, it is still an important part of their lives. Okay. Uh, for one, it offers an escape from the mundane, right? And their games directly compete with religion in that religion also offers you an escape from the mundane to another world, right? But it comes, as, as many people will tell you, it comes with many layers of guilt. Games do nothing right, of the sort. So they've been called alchemical in that they're very magical. The, the space of the game is transformed into a magical universe where it's the rules of the game that apply. It's not the rules of the um, world that apply there. Right? And uh, games and stories are two things that spread among cultures the fastest. We all love a new story. We all love a new game. Okay? Now to look at philosophical attitudes to play. Okay, to the Greeks, play represented many things. And if you see games, in fact, uh, Plato was probably the first person to study games from Europe. And he identified three aspects uh, to games. One is a central conflict, which is what pits two players against each other. Okay, a, a form of mimesis in which you are imitating some aspect of the real world. And then some sort of chaos so that the outcome of the game is not predetermined, which therefore makes it a game, which makes it playable. Right? Uh, as I said earlier, religions tend to see children as being sinful and unruly who need the discipline of the religious dogma to, you know, for them to grow up into useful adults. And very often religions have the attitude that play is simply idling. You should either be studying or praying, right? You need adult supervision. So if at all you're allowed to play, it's supposed to be supervised play. And uh, that has often persisted into this, this huge genre of what are known as uh, educational games, which any student can tell you they hate it instinctively. Later on, people have seen play as having an adaptive purpose. That is, you learn the things uh, in play, which then help you survive as an adult in the natural world. And they are a way by which we acquire knowledge. Okay. So there is a formal way of acquiring knowledge and an informal way of acquiring knowledge. And the informal is what play does. Okay. What's more important in my perspective, especially in the field of archaeopaisology, is that our games are our heritage. Okay? Our board games form part of the intangible heritage that we inherit from our ancestors. And intangible heritage is something that is common to all communities, whether it's hunter-gatherer, 
whether it's an agricultural community, an urbanized, an industrialized, a post-industrial community, all of us, you know, we share stories, songs, folklore, poems, games, okay, uh, designs from our forebears. Material culture shifts and moves and then eventually becomes part of the archaeologist's work. But this remains in the realm of the anthropologist. Occasionally, they also make part of the tangible heritage because a game is not just a mental construct. It is also, uh, you know, real things come into a game. So there are seeds, shells, knots, stones, you know, there are beautifully stitched uh, silk boards or uh, fancily crafted wooden boards, some of which I will show you, right? The other thing is they're very alchemic. That is, they are in some sense, while they are rooted in culture, they're also independent of culture. That's what makes them viral, to use a modern word. They can go from one culture to another very easily. Okay, Because once you're playing the game, only the rules of the game apply. Your external culture, your external world rules don't apply at all. Right? Today, for example, when we're playing chess, we're still playing the king and the queen and various other pieces, though none of them is any more relevant to uh, modern life. Right. They are also soft power. And this is something that India and China have possessed in a great abundance. And in fact, a very eminent scholar of games from the UK once said that the world's best games were invented by the Indians and the Chinese. Okay. Uh, they, they express their soft power in two ways. One is that they form bridges between cultures. Okay. You can carry a chessboard with you to any country. You will find someone who will play with you, right? And that acts as an icebreaker. And that helps you familiarize yourself with modern cultures, especially when you're a trader, a traveler, a tourist, a refugee. Okay? The other thing is that they help overcome differences within cultures. Okay? Because again, they are a shared heritage. Now, in the rest of the lecture, I'm going to expand on this theme a little more and look at the history of games, especially in their form of transmission as soft power and what they teach us about societies through that. Within a society, also they mirror social strata. Okay? So when you look at the material culture of a game, so for example, on the left is an exquisitely made uh, Pachisi board. Okay, it is known by uh, various names across various parts of the country. Uh, okay, so this is one made of silk cloth and uh, zari thread, okay, with exquisitely crafted dice and uh, game pieces, uh, which are, you know, made with lacquer. So there is a very rich investment made into crafting this game. This one was hand sewn by one of my uh, closest friends, Nyaneshwari Kamath. On the right, you see, this is at uh, on somewhere in Badami, uh, in one of the cave temples. Okay, again, it is known as Art Chalas in uh, Marathi, it is called uh, Kattam in Tamil. It is known by various names in various states. That is another aspect of games. The older they are, the more names they have. Uh, and this is just etched into the floor of the cave itself, right? So completely disposable in that sense. That once you're done, you can abandon it and there are no regrets. So coming. So a lot of the games and one aspect of my study is in documenting floor graffiti games. Uh, and we made a recent presentation at the International Board Games Seminar on floor graffiti games from Maharashtra. Okay. Uh, we are still collecting this in, it is comparatively understudied in Maharashtra compared to the other states. The, the state best studied is Karnataka, where uh, people from the Ramson's trio, uh, which is H.S. Dharmendra, R.G. Singh and Dilip Kauda, have intense 
I mean, it is it is a commendable for, I mean, amount of intensity with which they have documented games. Balambal Ramaswamy and Vinita Siddhartha and Tamil have gone around uh, documenting games, not so much games cut onto the floors of uh, ancient and medieval temples, but games as a folk tradition. And there's also work from Andhra Pradesh. Okay, but this data is nowhere near complete. Uh, we need a nationwide survey. The, the scale is beyond my individual doing, but I'm doing what I can. My colleagues are doing what they can. Okay. It has long remained an archaeologically neglected issue. So when they, whenever there is a site being documented, the roof is documented, the, the architecture, the, the paintings on the roof, the walls are documented for their sculptures, carvings, everything. The floors are often barely ever documented. Okay. Whereas often there are a large number of games etched on the floor. And this comes from a certain archaeological debate that has not been fully resolved as yet. Okay, And I'm hoping that I can nudge this debate in a certain direction, uh, which is that a lot of archaeologists in the initial uh, phases of archaeology, which is in the uh, 1880s and so on and so forth, often consider these games as being intrusive, that the graffiti games often found at monuments uh, were just intrusions by local people long after the monument had been abandoned. And that local shepherds were making them, local cowherds, uh, travelers, bandits even, you know, and therefore they have no uh, connection or relevance to the original monument. This is something that we are trying to uh, redefine. And in many places, we managed to show that no, there is a very integral association. The game is there at the monument for a purpose. Okay. One of the risks to these floor games is that they will probably, many places, they will probably die out even before we can document them. And the problem is the concept of Jirnodhar, that is, that's what we call it here, uh, which is the uh, revival of a monument where often it involves completely tearing down the structure and building an absolutely new one. Okay. Uh, many medieval structures uh, have been pulled down and replaced with RCC structures because there is, in all religions, Jewish, Jain, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, and there are lots of religions in Mumbai, all of them follow this, that when a religious structure is getting old, uh, instead of make, doing expensive repairs to it and trying to maintain it as it is, it is there is greater merit in just getting away, doing away with the old structure and putting up a brand new one because that gives you a lot of punya. That unfortunately is not just a danger to uh, sculptures and paintings and other things, to which at least conservationists and mu museologists and archaeologists take some interest in preserving those. But because this is a neglected field, these are just paved over, flowed over, and forgotten. So that is a risk that I face, and my team faces, my colleagues face, while we are on the field documenting them. Okay. The other, of course, is the very existential threat, which is that we are going to forget all these board games as an aspect of our culture itself, because A, we've got video games uh, coming and we just now completely virtualize the, that environment of play. Okay. And we also have marketed board games. So, you know, I, for example, grew up knowing hardly any of my traditional games. I grew up with games like Monopoly, Game of the States, the Game of Life, purely marketed games, right? branded games as we call them. And this discovery was rather late in my life. But these threats apart, let's go back and figure out the history of these and why modern people need to know ancient games. Okay, so we start with what are the world's oldest games? Okay, and the answer will probably surprise you. Okay, so the answer is knuckle bones. Okay, the simplest thing that we had to play with was pebbles, uh, the bones of the animals we've eaten, 
and uh, cowrie shells and various other things that we could collect. And from that, uh, there is a very famous game, again, known by many names across. Uh, it is it is almost universal. It, as far as I know, it is played across the globe by cultures, uh, cultures that have not even had contact with each other, especially it, it was being played even among the pre-Columbian cultures of the Americas, right? And this is a game known as Jacks or Knuckle Bones uh, or in Odia, Kaudi Khela or Marathi Sagar Kote or wherever, okay? You can play it with practically anything, okay? Pebbles of roughly the same size, the seeds of various trees, shells of various kinds, okay? And the game consists of tossing one in the air and picking the rest up, then tossing two in the air, picking the rest up, tossing three. So it's a bit of a game of skill, it doesn't have it doesn't really have too many rules in it it's a very nice sedentary game and uh, something we've almost all forgotten i mean in all our workshops in all our outreach programs we've only ever seen the old ladies of maharashtra coming and engaging in this game and we we were trying to teach this to younger children they they have a lot more stimulus in the form of their mobile phones so it's it's a, it's a little hard but Yes, this is one of the world's oldest games. It's been found in many archaeological contexts. Uh, and this is what we think. But coming back, some point of time in our history, and I'm not quite sure when, because this is probably prehistoric, we invented something known as the ludim. The ludim is like the gene of a game. Okay, Just as genes make up the tiniest bit of information required to make us, and therefore... You stitch them all together and we get a genome. Uh, so did game theorists uh, came up, come up with this idea of the ludim, the tiniest playable unit. Okay. So the toss of a dice is a ludim. A board with squares on it is another ludim. The number of players, each moving pawns is another ludim. And like that, you can stitch multiple ludims to form multiple games. Now, what this does is it essentially creates a sort of, you could say, genetics of games. This applies as much to board games, which I study, as also to sports, which I don't really study because there are enough sports historians and studiers of sports in other ways. Uh, but ludims create the uh, infrastructure of a game, the bare bones. So you can mix and match ludims to create a game. There are equilibria, okay, to use a mathematical term. A combination of certain ludims is stable and creates a playable game, but there are many other combinations that are often unplayable and the game is either rather bad to play at or completely unplayable. Okay. For example, chess is a very, very stable game. It has multiple pieces. Each piece has different moves and everything. The one thing that it does not sit well with is the rolling of dice. So there have been attempts at, you know, uh, merging chess with a game of dice and that hasn't really worked. So there are these bits of equilibria and where the ludimic equilibrium sits well, you get a lovely game. Okay. One of the earliest games that we know from the archaeological context is the game of 20 squares, whose origin, interestingly, is mysterious. We don't quite know. Okay, It's called the game of 20 squares because it literally has 20 squares on which is played with. Uh, on the bottom left is a very famous board from the British Museum. Uh, which was excavated from the tomb of a uh, princess uh, at the ancient city of Ur, which is how it got its name. And it is made of a lot of, it is wood, basic wood, uh, with a lapis lazuli uh, etching, the, uh, inlay done on it, okay? Very richly decorated with a lot of mystic symbols, okay? Uh, on my top right is a similar board, uh, from Egypt. So this is from Espremia, this is from Egypt uh, with interesting pieces. This is at the Metropolitan Museum in New, New York. On the top left is the identical game to the Ur game, uh, but excavated from an archaeological site known as the Shehri Sokhta. So these three 
show that this was a game popular among elites. But on the right, you see a version of this very same uh, board, but this is now carved into the stone, okay, at a palace somewhere in Mesopotamia. So again, if the palace guards were playing it, they were just making a makeshift board and getting along with the game. Okay. A very, very long time, it was unknown as to how to play this game. Okay. So people have documented, and especially at the Shari Shokta, okay, a large number of such uh, boards have been discovered. A very tantalizing board from Dhola Vira is also included here on the bottom right, okay, which seems to represent this board game, but it is broken, so we're not quite sure. But for a very long time, it was, well, because of its pattern of squares, it was identified as a board game, but it was not quite known as to how exactly the game would be played. Until Irving Finkel of the British Museum, who is both a board game expert and a cuneiform export, expert, managed to read a particular tablet uh, from Assyria in which the rules are mentioned. And that now makes what was a fossil of a game, fossil in almost a literal sense, because here it is, etched into the stone and just frozen in time. But here he managed to recover the fossil of a game and we can now play it again. And there's a beautiful video of him on YouTube showing young people how to play the game. Okay, so this is another aspect. Now this is a game of chess at the... Uh, Sorry, this is at a museum in Pune. I forget the name, uh, but a very exquisite board, chess board, okay, with a lot of uh, ivory work done on it, pieces made of ivory, right? Again, this shows that sometimes uh, there's just more. It's not just a game to people. It becomes an heirloom. It becomes an obsession, and then they invest. It's 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 like a show of wealth. It's an app. It's it's as much. Um, you know, as today we often say there are man toys like super yachts and private planes. These were toys of an earlier era. Okay. But from here, I'm going to talk to you a long story about chess. Okay. What little we know of the origin of chess, which is still somewhat mysterious, but the evidence seems to be condensing around the idea that it was probably invented in the court of the Maukhari dynasty of Kanauj around the 4th or 5th century AD. Okay, probably invented to teach princes the art of warfare, which is, you know, anyone who sees a chessboard gets that immediately. It's also called Chaturanga, which is the same word for an army. And the word Chaturanga, for example, appears in the Ramayanam, where it is described as the cavalry, the infantry, chariots, and the elephants. From here, it goes to Persia, it goes to the Middle East, and then it goes further west. Uh, now, these are pieces that I have seen personally at the Kanaj Museum. And uh, these probably seem to indicate how the game might have evolved, that at some point, children were playing with these little figurines, the figurine of a chariot, of an elephant, a warrior, a horse rider, and that someone then sort of arranged them, made up these rules and said, look, here's a way I can show you how a chariot functions in a war, how, a, how cavalry functions, how an elephant mounted warrior would function, and so on. Okay. Uh, another popular game among kings and the nobility is Pachisi. Okay. Uh, confusingly, in Tamil Nadu, it is also called Chaturangam. Uh, it's certain people, okay, but another game popular, very popular in India. And another very interesting story for it the earliest evidence we have for Pachisi is in the Skandapura in the 8th century. Okay, now we don't quite know whether it, it refers to a game. It is said that Shiva invented the game, he taught it to Parvati, she beat him at it, he went into a sulk, okay. 
then his son uh, Skanda came around and he learned the reason for his father's disappointment. So he learned the game. He went and challenged his mother. He defeated her. Uh, she went into a sulk. And then her son, her elder son, Ganesha, comes around. He learns it from her. He goes and challenges both his father and brother, defeats them, wins everything of them. His father's Nandi, his brother's Vail, uh, you know, uh, barring their loincloth, he manages to win back everything because it's also a very popular gambling game. Uh, until, you know, as it happens with stories like this, Narada has to intervene and said the balance of the universe will be shattered if you if your family quarrels like this, and then finally peace was made. While we know this, now we have documented Pachisi boards from the caves on the floors at the Elora caves as well as the Nashik caves. Okay, now this creates a very interesting uh, dichotomy that there is the earliest literary source does not go beyond the 8th century, whereas what we're seeing on the floors are, can be dated well back to the 2nd century. But there are problems. Are the boards as old as the monuments? Okay. And what is the concrete evidence we have either way? The most concrete bit of evidence we have is this gigantic vanity Pachisi board that you see at Fatehpur Sikri, okay, where the emperor used to sit and play and he used slave girls as his pieces. So they would sit here in this mandapam uh, playing, and they would throw dice and determine the moves, and then one soldier would walk out of here, tell the girl, slave girl, how much, how many paces to move, she would move, and then again the dice would be thrown, and so on and so forth. By the way, he also had, he was extremely fond of this game, the Emperor Akbar. In fact, at one point he decided that a four-player game was not invented, so it was not enough. So, to include his entire court, he invented a 16-player version. Okay, so in the normal game, you usually go up one arm, then go down the other arm, go up the other arm. Like this, you go for four arms here, you have to go around 16 arms. Okay, I don't know how much, how long this game took to play. It probably took months. Then we have a game called Alcock. Okay. Well, what we know of it is that it probably originated from a game called Siga in Egypt. And later in early medieval Arabia, it developed into its current form, okay, which has 12 counters for each player. And then they play it like what? Drafts is a descendant of Alcock, And that's how it is played. So Rules-wise, it has stayed rather stable, even though the nature of the boards have changed quite a lot. So it's again a game board that mimics the conflict between two armies, but with mechanisms of play that are very different from chess. So now let's look at these things. And when it comes to India, Alcock, it becomes both a hunt game and a war game. So it originates as a war game. There are two equal sets of armies facing each other on the board. These are my clock boards. Uh, embroidered with uh, woolen thread. Uh, so I also like want to make some heirlooms for myself. And, and I'm very fascinated with the material culture of games as well. So uh, while our popular imagine is to imagine them as being played on a cardboard, you know, painted and uh, decorated, they were often either just directly etched on the floor or people had them done out of cloth, cloth being very, very easy to transport. So this is a war game, two equal armies, but on the same board, you also have a hunt game, okay? This is a hunt game very popular in Mysore, which is called Men and Elephants. Okay, the players have unequal powers. Okay, so, Let's look at the evolution of Alcock. Okay, as I said, it starts out as Siga, and then in Africa, it has its descendants. Uh, from Africa, it goes to Arabia, where it becomes the game of Al Kirkat, which is the modern game of Alcock, which you see in the background. Uh, 
From there, when it goes to your room, it becomes the game of drafts, which is now the international standard. Okay? Blame colonialism for it or whatever. There are a very large name number. So Zamma is, for example, a duplication of the board. So you get a bigger board. Fanorona is the Malagasy version, an extremely popular game in Madagascar. It goes into Southeast Asia. It comes to India. Okay, what happens to, in, to it in India is the most interesting part of this. It isn't an Indian game to start with. Okay, it came to India with the Arabs. Okay, in the period which we often call uh, the Indo-Arab trade period, which is in the uh, early medieval period, which is from the late 8th century onwards until uh, the, about the 12th, 13th century. But it may even have come earlier. It isn't of Indian origin, but what happened to it once it reached India is that it went into an extensive, extensive flowering. Okay, so it acquired a very large number of rules, all kinds of games could be played on it. Okay, and I'm showing you the kind of, this, this just shows you the diversity, I'm not going to read out all these names. Okay, what happens is you see that there are uh, different shapes done to it. Okay, so coming back here, uh, people found out that this, this game, which has, you know, uh, 12 counters for one player and 12 counters for the other player was not enough for them. It was getting over very quickly. So they added wings. Okay, and this expanded the number of players to the number of pieces you had from 12 to 16. That wasn't enough. So you add another couple of weights. And like this, now you add eight weights. So that it becomes a really complex, time-consuming uh, game. And that adds to the masala, which is something that we all Indians like. Okay. What has also happened is that here it has found various other shapes as well. So instead of just playing it on a square board, uh, we have found that you can play it on two triangles facing each other, or turn the square into a circle, expand that circle, okay? So the rules remain the same, the patterns change. And that is a very interesting phenomenon. And we see different uh, patterns in different parts of the world showing where they originated and, they, and where they became popular, okay? Alkirk by itself is barely played in India. So this stone board that you see in the background, okay, this is a board that I've uh, my colleagues documented at the uh, cave complex of Mandapeshwar in Mumbai, and which is one of the rare places where we find it in this form. Very often it is found in uh, a complex form, okay, with one or with two or more wings. There are also occasional games with one wing. What also happens is, and this is again something that's more in the realm of speculation rather than anything else. Uh, Alkirk meets an Indian game that in Tamil we call Adupuliyattam, right? Which is an unequal game. That is, it has two players, but the two players control different powers of pieces. So the, the green bottle caps here represent the tigers, the blue ones represent the goats. They have different powers, different mechanisms to play and to win the game. What happens very interestingly is this game gets adapted to the Alkirk board, okay, and becomes the Bach Chal uh, game. And then that then adopts a very different number of geographies and so on and so forth. Okay, now coming to some aspects of cultural transmission, okay? Now, one thing we know is that the more complex a cultural trait is, the lower is the rate of innovation and greater is the fidelity to that. So chess, for example, is a very complex game and therefore essentially worldwide it is played in the same way, okay? Whereas a game like Pachisi, and I'll show you how it has uh, diffused across the world, is simpler, and therefore allows greater changes. So you can make 
changes to the rules, to the shape of the board uh, in accordance with what you and your friends are comfortable with. Okay, the, again, coming back to the idea of ludemic equilibria. You can change the ludemes to modify the game and you achieve a, what, you know, to use mathematical language again, another local minimum where there is a stable playable game that you can uh, play with. Okay. So, on the right, a very large number of boards, okay, uh, of the game of 20 squares. Not, not easy to recognize. But this is the basic shape, but then people got really innovative with these shapes. Okay. And games have traveled around with trade, with conquest, with diplomacy over many periods of times. Okay. So, as I said, the game of 20 squares and the game of 58 holes are very, very old games. Okay. In the early historic period, you have chess emerging from North India. Uh, in the Indo-Roman trade period, you have Roman games coming and becoming part of our game repertoire. Okay. There are games we've, we've gotten from the Southeast Asians. There are games we've gotten from the Africans. There are games we've gotten from the Chinese. And then, of course, a whole number of games that we have exported worldwide. Okay. So, to show you the diffusion of 20 squares and also... Another very interesting aspect of human history is the pace of change. Okay, so today the pace of change is really rapid. Okay. Uh, if you have a four-year-old pressure cooker, it's probably functioning exactly the same way as it did the day on the first day you bought it. But if you have a four-year-old mobile phone, it's probably terribly obsolete, right? Uh, now, when you go back to the Bronze Age, change tended to happen over centuries and millennia rather than months. So you see a diffusion of the game from what we know that the game of 20 squares, the oldest documented instances of the game are probably from uh, the eastern part of the Middle East, touching upon the Indian subcontinent, which has led somebody to to uh, speculate that because it is a dice game, it probably came from the South, uh, South Asian region. Okay. Uh, with, with no real great proof. But it, the oldest bits seem to come from there and then they travel uh, westward. Okay. On the other hand, the game of 58 holes is a beautiful race game. The one that you see on the left was excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun. I think so, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's called Foxes and Hounds because two players have the, the ones with the ears up are the foxes, the ones with the ears down are the dogs. Okay, It emerges in Egypt and then spreads all over the Middle East. Another very popular game. Okay, Chess, on the other hand, is a very interesting story where we have greater con greater information about its spread. It is a more of a historic rather than an archaeological event. So yes, today it's become the byword for diplomatic maneuvers, right? We use the word checkmate or stalemate for showing uh, st stories of uh, war or diplomacy, right? Uh, those of us who are old enough know that the most famous chess game ever was probably Spassky versus Fisher, right? Uh, between the US and the USSR at the height of the Cold War, played in Iceland, okay? And of course, it, it is a very addicting game, right? It has, its, it has its religious followers. And then what's most interesting is the number of religious prohibitions against it. So there have been a number of edicts issued by the Catholic Church, fatwas issued by Muslim clerics, okay, uh, preachings by Hindu sadhus and religious people of all colors and creeds saying that do not play chess, the time wasted in chess would be better spent in praying. Okay, that I think that is just a testament to the popularity of the game more than anything else. 
Okay. The Visarishni Chatrang is probably the earliest manuscript. It comes from the 6th century, which mentions chess in some detail. And therefore, the oldest written historical mention of chess. Okay. Barring one rather cryptic uh, and mystifying a mention in uh, the Harsha Charita. Okay, where the poet Banabhatta describes the reign of Harsha uh, as Ashtapadanam Chaturanga Kalpana, okay, which is armies drawn up on an Ashtapada board. So Ashtapada is an older board game known from many uh, archaeological and literary references, a completely forgotten game. So if, if you were to call it a fossil game, that would be right. So you see that there are instances of Ashtapada in, uh, at the stupa at Sannati, the stupa at uh, Barhut, where it is, it is illustrated as playing. It occurs in the Jataka stories. There is a specific ban on Ashtapada by the Buddhist canon. And so we know that it was a game popular. But in, by the time of the Harsha Charita, it seems that the board had been appropriated for playing chess and the original game had been forgotten. But instead, this very cryptic thing that Harsha brought about so much peace that the only place where armies were drawn up were on the Ashtapada board. Okay. So what does the Vizarishni Chitrang say? Chatrang is the old Persian word for chess, basically a direct derivative of Chaturanga. Okay. It does say that an Indian king called Devi Shan, which uh, Renate Sayyad has identified as uh, Devasharva Varman, uh, of the Maukhari dynasty of Kanach, that he sent a, a beautiful silken chessboard with pieces made of emeralds and rubies as a gift to the king of Persia. Okay, with a challenge that if you can figure out this game, I will understand that the Persians are culturally superior to the Indians. And of course, you know, the, it being a Persian manuscript, it talks about how courtier after courtier of the Persian Shah failed to figure it out. And then one old, uh, retired, uh, actually had been put in jail, uh, called uh, Bozor Mihir. He was called and then he took three days and he actually figured the entire game out. He actually defeated the Indian ambassador at his own game. And then because the return gift had been uh, given, uh, Pozorni went back to his jail cell and dreamt up the game of backgammon and presented that to the Indians. And the Indians could not master the game, and then the Indians had to accept the cultural superiority of the Persians. Now that's that's what the Vizarishni Chatrang says. Okay. I will leave that to you to decide which of the games is superior. Backgammon is a game that has gone almost entirely extinct in India. Chess is popular all the world over, including in Iran. But yes, through a lot of historic work, Renati Sayed did put together the idea that this Devi Sharm of the Vizarishna is most likely Deva Sharvavarman of Kanuj. A big clue is that Shah of Kanuj is mentioned in the Vizarishna Satra. Okay. Now, a very interesting map that I made from my studies. So here in India, at Kanuj, you have the game of Chaturanga coming up. This is the old pattern Ashtapada board. It has these crosses in the center, crosses in the corner like this. This is nothing like a modern chess board. From here, it goes via diplomacy to Iran, where it becomes Chatrang and loses these crosses. And then after the Muslim conquest, uh, when the Arab forces overrun the Sasanian Empire and Persia is brought into the fold of the Caliphate, Arabs promptly learn chess and adopt it as their own. And that's how we get the modern word for chess, Shatranj. Chatrang becomes Shatranj to suit Arabic pronunciation. Okay. Many changes happen, but because Islam prohibits making human figures, the figures become very abstract in shape. That's why many of our chess pieces, even though they have human names like king, bishop, queen, uh, Knight and all the pieces are rather abstract. Okay. 
from here it passes into Spain via the Arab conquest of Spain. And at the Reconquista, when Ferdinand and Isabella of, you know, throw out the Arabs and reconquer Spain, the game of chess now becomes part of the European thing. And then it migrates all over Europe and somewhere it acquires the checkered board that is very familiar to us and the modern rules. And because of colonialism, it, world over we play with the European rules for chess as opposed to the Arab or the Indian rules. That was on the left side of this presentation, but there's something very interesting going on on the right side. So this part is mostly through diplomacy, conquest, to a certain sense of elitism. Chess also moves east of India, mostly through trade and probably with the Choras also some aspect of conquest. It reaches Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia, it jumps to China and from China, it reaches Japan. But you now there are some very interesting changes. In China, it becomes the game of Shang-Chi. The nature of the board itself changes and the nature of the pieces also change. Okay. Uh, so the king, for example, is remodeled to represent the Chinese emperor where he is in a palace. Okay. So in this game, there are two fields that are divided by a river, which doesn't happen in Chaturanga. There's a little palace here where the, the emperor stays. He must always be protected by two mandarins around him. Then there are other pieces. They uh, demote the elephant piece a bit. Okay, even though the name of the game, Shang-Chi, literally means elephant. But the elephant piece is not terribly important to them. Whereas in the Indian version, Chaturanga, the elephant piece, which sits right next to the king, is very important. Uh, but instead of the elephant piece, there is a cannon piece. Okay? Cannons were already used in Chinese warfare at the time the game was entering. And they, they felt that a game mimicking warfare could not not have a cannon. And so they have a cannon piece and that's the most important piece on the board. And then from China, it spreads to Japan where in adherence to Japanese culture, it becomes a game of shogi, which is even more complex. It has a lot of complex rules and a lot more thinking is evolved in playing shogi. Okay, so that's what happens when A, you have migration of a game attached to prestige attached to elitism as opposed to when a game migrates on trade routes with the common people without all the attached paraphernalia of prestige. So in China, so we call chess as the game of kings and king of games. That isn't the description in uh, China or Japan for it. It's another game. In China, the game of kings is the game of go, okay, which is their own prestige game. But you see now represents study in contrast. Okay. As I said, Pachisi was popular among all classes of Indians. So you, you see it etched on the floor at Nasik, which I showed you. Uh, you also see this fantastic board that Akbar had at uh, Fatehpur Sik. Okay. So once the uh, Middle East Norths, they come to India, they find this game travels very quickly back into the Middle East and it's very popular all over the Middle East. So it's called Burgis, okay? Um, and again, uh, an Arab phonetic representation of Pachisi. It's still paired with cowrie shells that are still imported from India and women make this for their dowries. So they make a hand stitch thing that they will carry with them when they get married and go to the marital house. So it's called Burgis. From the Arabs, it went to the Spaniards just as chess moved. But now this is a, this is not a royal transmission. This is a local um, uh, common people transmission. So from there it goes to Spain, where it becomes a game of parchis. Okay. From Spain it goes with the colonialists and it becomes the game of parques in Colombia. Okay. You can see the board it has already changed quite a lot. Uh, from Spain it goes to the US and the Spanish game has been marketed to Americans as Parchisi. It's a very modern development from the 20th century. 
There are also versions of the game that go from India, probably via the Silk Road. And there is a South Korean game called Youth Play, which is very similar. Okay, this this whole class of games is called the cross and circle games. Okay. In the colonial period, the Indian game is directly lifted and carried to the United Kingdom, where it became the, the one that today all of us know worldwide as the game of Ludo. Okay. The British Navy developed its own form of Ludo with slightly different rules, and that is called Akkars. Okay. And even today, uh, one of the shibboleths they have to recognize a fellow naval player is if he will play Akkars or Ludo. Only Navy men know how to play Akkars. Okay. It spreads all over Europe as well. And it has very interesting names. Okay. So the German name for Ludo is Mensch Argere Dish Nicht. Okay. It's loosely translated means, please don't get upset with me. Okay. So those of you who've played this game, and practically all of us have, we know how aggravating it can be. In fact, a branded version of the game is also sold as aggravation. That's the name of the game. Okay. Because you're racing to the finish and then you can get cut by a player and if you start all over again, right? And then you're looking to take your revenge, but you're all slaves to the dice. So it, it often ends up in great unfairness where you can, you know, sometimes you get lucky and all four of your pieces go home very quickly. Sometimes you get really unlucky. You keep getting cut by the other players. Your chances for revenge are also little, right? We've, we've, this is this, this what makes the anthropology very interesting. That uh, it's a, it's it's not a game meant for winning. It's a game meant for playing, because it because it has this um, you know destructive method. Once destroyed, see you start all over again. It's not like once it's not like chess where once you're taken off the board, you're off the board altogether, right? This you because it's like the circle of life, and you start over and over again. So the people have compared it with. Uh, Hindu philosophy and saying that probably has its origin there where the, you know, each piece getting cut and starting all over again is you taking birth and rebirth and rebirth and going around the samsara, right? So on all of that for. So that aggravating aspect is what is remembered by the German. There's also a version of this game played in Quebec known as Talk. It's a unique cultural value to them. Now, completely unrelated, and this is again very surprising, and many people have speculated on it, is that there is a pre-Columbian game in Mexico called Patoli, and a game among the Native Americans known as uh, Zone Al, okay, which in Rule play there again played with dice on a square cross shaped board. Okay, but there does not seem to be any any way of suggesting that these came over from Asia. Some people have suggested, for example, that somebody got shipwrecked, somebody from East Asia got shipwrecked and landed in Mexico across the Pacific Ocean, surviving all its whales and sharks, and I don't know what other storms and creatures and brought the game. There are others who say it's a completely de novo innovation, but it looks very, very eerily similar to GC. And it's one of those mysteries that make life worth in, you know, as Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. So this is one of those things which make it your mission to investigate. Alkirk, okay, it starts here in Egypt somewhere. It spreads all over Egypt. It has multiple forms. It spreads to India. And then in India, it takes on a wild number of shapes and forms, okay? But this is a game that has traveled a lot more easily. It has traveled over all forms and cultures, okay, colonially. So there are even versions of Alkirk played among uh, Native Americans, but we know that they came with the Colombian conquests. Okay, so this is another one that is spread 
entirely in a subaltern manner. It hasn't traveled with kings or conquerors or armies or navies. It's just traveled among traders. They've played it. They've innovated it. The more bored they got, the more inventive they got, the good thing about games is that games and boredom feed on each other. The more bored you get, the more complex a game you will invent. Uh, you know, the more inventive you get, so you explore what, again, to borrow something from theoretical physics or maths, something called a phase space of games. Okay, what are the multiple possible, I you know, ludimic combinations I can make to create a new game. Many of them will be unstable, unplayable. Some of them will become stable. They get repeated and then they become consolidated and they become then part of your heritage and then they're transmitted across generations. Some games you try once, try twice, thrice. You just give it up and you move on. Then we have these tiger games. Okay. Uh, Arupaliyatam is the one I'm the most familiar with, but there are many other versions of it. It's again moved back and forth. Okay. And again, something that needs to be studied. Uh, a lot of it depends on both anthropological study of going and talking to communities in the games they play, as well as archaeological studies of examining what material heritage has been passed on from the past, either as graffiti games or as board pieces from excavations, okay? So whenever there is news of something excavated from somewhere, people send that to me, okay? Oh, this was found at Kiradi, this was found at uh, Sanati, this was found at uh, Monjadro, this was found in uh, Iran, this is on here. So people send me news that look, there's a game piece found, a game board found. It's very rare to find a game board. Game pieces are a lot more easier to find. They're often made of terracotta, of stone, of uh, wood, you know, and then whatever survives uh, in the archaeological record, people get excited. Right? So coming to the very last leg, won't take more than two minutes. How are we studying these ancient games? What have I been doing all this while? Okay. So a lot of prior studies have happened. Okay. So as I said, the Ramson trio did it. Dr. Balambal has done it. The uh, Anthropological Survey of India did a, not a very comprehensive survey, but at least an initial start. And I hope they carry on with it. Uh, the Asiatic Society at Bengal had done a survey many, many years ago, which they have published. Okay. So a lot of study has gone before. Uh, Sham had shown the proceedings of the conference I conducted. The Institution Trust has done one more conference after me uh, when I was out uh, for personal reasons. And so we have now furthered the thing. Okay. But there is a lot we need to do. The first thing, the one thing that I am deeply focused on is documenting games from as many monuments as possible. Okay, where in the monument is it located? So we do know that at temples, for example, the, you know, if you take the Sanctum Santorum as the, the nucleus of a circle and radiating outwards, if it's the closer it is to the Sanctum, then the higher the caste that was playing it. And if it's really far away, you know, outside the walls of the temple and all, it's being played by the lower castes. If it's inside the temple compound, the middle caste, if it's actually close to the Garbhagraha, the upper caste, and so on and so forth. So that is something we know, ge ge geographic context within a monument, which tells us the social hierarchy going on. Okay. We know some games, like this is Alkirk, this is Ashtapada. What on earth is this game? This is found very commonly in Vijayanagar and some Hoysala temples. Okay. Uh, we haven't figured out the rules. Okay, if you play it with Pachisi rules or with Kattam rules, it works. It, it's a decent dice game. It works. But was that how it was played? You don't know. We find Palanguri or Mankala all over the place. Okay. For like one of the big mysteries is Palanguri is played by zero people in Maharashtra today. And for the last three generations, it has not been played. But we find it in every archaeological context, every temple, every fort, every cave complex. 
as a Palanguri board somewhere tucked away in some corner, sometimes right in the middle of the Chaitya Hall floor, sometimes in one corner of the temple, sometimes even on a beam that has subsequently been used in the construction and has either gone to the ceiling or onto the wall. So the documentation of all of this is something that I am focused on and my team has been uh, doing a lot of work on it. My colleagues are also focused on visualization of, of transmitting these games to a younger generation, getting them to become familiarized with this culture. Okay. And that's what we've been doing. So thank you very much for your attention and over to you, uh, THT. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for a, a wonderful, uh, uh, in fact, um, you know, I'm a bit speechless because I wasn't uh, expecting such, um, uh, you know, such a wide, uh, uh, you know, range of uh, games, actually. Uh, even uh, within the, uh, you know, particularly I have already heard about, you know, things that we have been aware as uh, children whether it is Palanguri or Adupuli or uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, I don't even know what they are called, the four-sided uh, 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 boards uh, where we play with the dice and, of course, the chess. But that there is so much of, uh, uh, you know, connectivity and history to them that similar games have been played. You can sort of guess that games, I mean, it's like evolution of language, uh, biological evolution games it is it seems very reasonable that there are only probably five or six ideas or ten ideas or whatever it is with various combinations of it you start uh, putting together the rules of a game you know uh, but there's one big challenge that I want to uh, ask you yeah you know, there's no write up about how a game is played what can an archaeologist do? You end up seeing something. You see a particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, a board game like, uh, uh, you know, uh, etching. Because they are not deep reliefs. They're just some etchings. Wh how do you even figure out what it could be? It is like a puzzle, exactly like a lost script. Like the right. industry thing. And you have no clue. Absolutely. That's literally what you... So you have to find... A, somewhere managed to find a write-up, like Irving Winkle got really lucky mm -hmm. in that both his in fields of interest managed to converge on that one tablet. Okay. And he found the rules of the game, right? So therefore, the fossil game became a living game. But as okay. I showed you, like the example of the Vijayanagar game, it's also fossil. Right. You can apply the rules of uh, Kattam to it and it plays quite well because we have games like Vimanam and Tamanat which are similar in shape. but And if you apply the rules, it's playable. But is that the original? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. So we have to find some, I don't know, some manuscript from Vijayanagar times or maybe some inscription somewhere that will tell you what the game is. Somehow, you know, the sad thing is that the Indian inscriptions are all fairly serious stuff, right? Uh, whether it is, you know, epigraphs, uh, you know, on stone in a temple or a, a copper plate inscription uh, or even the later uh, palm leaf manuscripts that we can get hold of, invariably talk about a fairly uh, serious stuff, you know, a legal, uh, you know, verdict, uh, you know, donations and such. We don't have the lighter side of things. Of I mean, of course, we have had uh, some something about food. Uh, in various uh, Saraswati Mahal uh, manuscripts and uh, books. But I don't know if uh, if there has ever been a document found somewhere that talks about the kind of games that people played in uh, not not too far back in a you know, couple of thousand years back, but even early medieval India, the, uh, the last 500 years, you know, the post-Mughal period and so on. Uh, is there anything that you are uh, aware of? Some manuscript that talks about these things? Yeah, so there are quite a lot of manuscripts, especially a number of Sanskrit manuscripts pertaining to chess, many from the medieval period. Okay, but other, uh, than, other than chess. No, I will come back to chess. But other right. than... Then uh, there is the very famous Manasal Lhasa, 
Okay. Uh, which has in its one of its vimshatis. Uh, you know, it is divided in 20 parts and each part is called a vimshati. One of its vimshatis is fully focused on board games. I see. Huh. Okay. Um, the, the sad bit is that that is that that has not been translated. Oh, okay. Or, huh. So while many other aspects of the Manasalas, especially on food and culture and other things have been translated, some reason this is untranslated. Uh, but there's a friend of mine in uh, Denmark who was actually sitting down to translate it. Wow. That's so it does carry a number of board games. It, for example, has a detailed description of backgammon, a game that that has very little, uh, you know, Indians don't play it as a traditional Indian game. It's seen as a club game brought over by the colonialists. Okay. But we have seen uh, backgammon etched in the caves at Nasik, at Gandhar Pale, at Mandap. Okay. So we do know that it's it is ancient in India. It has so some point of time it was being played and then it got forgotten. And then there is a reference in the Manasalas. Okay. Uh, so we'll come to chess. There are uh, you know there is there's a question from uh, one of the viewers, and yeah. I have few questions. Uh, I will I will anyway combine a uh, few questions uh, in chess and outside uh, as we keep moving around. So there's a question from Ramesh Babu and he wants to know <coughs> if you have come across any evidence to show that ancient battle formations were sort of similar to Chaturan. So but there is a detailed description of what an army should look like in the Ramayana. Uh -huh. And it says Chaturanga. The name of the army is Chaturanga. Four parts, Chaturanga. Okay. Which is infantry, the foot soldiers. So you see the infantry lined up. You know, the first row of your chess lineup is all infantry, all your okay. pawns. Okay. Then you have the elephant riders. Okay. The Hasti. Okay. So in the chess, the original Chaturanga game formation in India, you have the king and the minister. Right. And to the left of the minister, to the right of the king, you have the Hasti, the elephant. Okay. Flanking them is the horse caval the cavalry, the horse rider, mm. which is the Ashwa. Okay. You have Hasti, you have Ashwa, you have, uh, then you have Ratha. Okay. So what is called... So Ratha is uh, what, uh, Bishop? No, Bishop is the Hasti. Okay. Ashwa is the knight. Ah, and that will be the uh, Rook. The Rook is the uh, chariot, the Ratha. Okay. okay. Ratha. Through some mispronunciation, it Ratha became Rook, Rook, and Rook became Rook. Okay, okay. And then the front line is the infantry. So the, the parallel is direct. Okay. We know that it is a war game conceptualized onto the board. Okay. Interesting. Okay. There are a couple of questions. Uh, one a comment and uh, one... Uh, a question from uh, Ramaswamy. Uh, his comment is that, you know, he was a little late to the talk. So do not know the scope of the talk. He says uh, that the whole interesting talk is uh, about board games. But there have been many ancient games which were in such. Examples are from Barhut depicting wrestling games and another beautiful one with gamblers in terracotta. Then Degram, women playing with a ball in wall paintings, etc. So that's a comment. Uh, so here, I you know obviously you were largely board games or related uh, you know dice and uh, such is what you were focusing on. But his question is, would the Ardupuli Artam be a derivative of Alkirk, which you did uh, uh, highlight it? But you know uh, there was a comment subsequently by uh, uh, Dr. Balambal who you uh, mentioned. She's there uh, following the talk. She was saying, you know, why couldn't it be the other way? So, you would, would you like to sort of expand and add a little bit to this? Hey, again, these all these games have their roots in, you know, the needs and uh, environments of the people who played them. Ardupali Artam is a shepherd's game. It is still played by shepherds, cowherds, others. So, they are, okay. you know, uh, it, it mimics the... You know, every day you take your sheep out to graze, you go into the, out of the village, into mm -hmm. the forested area. Mm -hmm. okay? So you have to protect your audio. There are, there are tigers in the forest who will naturally seize your goats. So it becomes, 
you know, it's a game of wits between the shepherd and the tiger, which has then been yeah. to this game. There are uh, many other versions of it. So in Rajasthan, for example, the game is called lions and goats because there are no tigers in the deserted part of Rajasthan. Okay. Uh, similarly, in other parts of the world, it is leopards and buffaloes because neither tigers nor goats are available. So it changes according to the animal. In Europe, it is the fox and the geese. Okay. So this is rooted in people's experiences and their cultures. Ah, but is there any way we can say the directionality is this way or that way? The directionality, firstly, is very, very hard to predict. But there is one thing. The, the game is, this the shape, especially the triangular board, is common in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And it isn't found further west. Mm -hmm. So it is certainly not an import. So it is either from south east into South Asia or vice versa, mm -hmm. but it is restricted to this region. Okay. I think that the game of Alkirk met the game of Ardbuli Atom somewhere, somewhere in India. And then the two evolved into a new set. So they got married and then they had a lot of children of their own. Okay. That's so, that's that's really an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, there is there is a, a comment uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Paramita uh, Das. It says, will yes. you kindly share your email so that we can share any rock cut boards we find? We have a few in Assam, but I had thought they were war strategy as they were in proximity to prolonged war sites. So uh, if you could share your uh, contact details, she would uh, get in touch with you. Dr. Sure, mine is R A A M E S H G R at the rate outlook.com. Um, so R A A M E S H at the at, rate uh, G R at the rate outlook.com. Ramesh G R at the rate outlook.com. Okay, at the rate at I'm just typing it at outlook.com. So I've uh, you know given it where the at and uh, dot, please replace it with the appropriate symbols. I understand. Dr. Das. Okay. Yeah, I have uh, I have added that. Now back to another. I would question. like to mention Dr. Balambal is my senior mentor. I'm very grateful that she has attended the talk. Oh, I think there are quite a few people who are attending who seem to know you well, and uh, there's a lot of uh, vibrant conversation going on in the uh, uh, YouTube, uh, uh, you know, the chat uh, section. Oh wow. So uh, uh, okay. So now uh, to uh, you know, questions from Srividya Jayakumar. She wants to know if there is a compilation of ancient board games that have originated from India, a validated authentic list. Would you uh, like to point her to something if that is there? A validated authentic list. Now, it's, it's a little hard to say this because, see, these emerge from people and the actual point of origin is very hard to pinpoint. Even with a game like chess, where, mm -hmm. where there is a lot known historically, it is still very hard to pinpoint. See, okay. these things don't get written down. As I said, uh, you know, as you also pointed out, we don't tend to take games seriously. Mm -hmm. If somebody invented a game, there is no record epigraphic right. that I invented such and such. Right. Okay. It's un unlike, say, a particular war maneuver or something where that get tomes and tomes written on it. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's, true. that's true. I think, you know, uh, we have a sort of sense of, I think it is more a social sense that certain things are uh, serious and important and uh, valuable and utilitarian and certain things are sort of frivolous and uh, it's good. I mean, you have to have uh, your lighter moments and uh, not be just too stuffy all the time. But they are not important enough to document. I, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I, I, I'm just guessing. You know, the amount of, for example, the amount of mathematics manuscripts that we have, uh, all kinds of scientific manuscripts, the chemistry manuscripts, astrology, irrespective of whatever, you know, people's views may be today in the modern outlook, whole uh, set of manuscripts, including you know, cooking. Uh, or uh, religious. I mean, it, uh, it just there's so much more to it than everything else put together. 
that the amount of religious philosophical uh, spiritual material but in terms of uh, and dance for example if you take classical dance uh, starting from natya shastra and you move uh, downwards the amount of material that is available which itself we have not translated i mean you talked about monasolasa the fact that it has not been fully translated uh, you can easily figure out probably there are tens of thousands probably hundreds of thousands that are there in uh, sanskrit and uh, such languages uh, classical languages not translated and coming into the uh, you know the last 1000 years were in multiple languages not translated and accessible to the modern uh, languages it's uh, compared to that uh, this kind of you know double quotes frivolous games that children play games that um, you know shepherds play games that kings play even they have you know this this nothing that we have as a compendium unfortunately uh, so uh, so one is yeah the notion of frivolity is actually a very uh, how do i say a very victorian thing or a rather protestant thing probably mm-hmm. you know part of the attitudes you uh, acquired with our colonial masters mm-hmm. uh because there are quite a number of manuscripts that are lying untranslated so there is the chaturanga sara sarvaswa which was okay. written by uh, krishna raja wadiyar the third maharaj of mysore aha uh-huh. okay uh so it was translated by vasanta rangachar but the translation is not publicly available she died before it could be published i see and it is now sitting with a collector i have actually traced the collector uh he is a good friend of mine so that is another story it was quite the story uh there is as i said the untranslated bits of the manasolasa there there are a very large number of sanskrit chess manuscripts so chess is seen as a you know serious subject serious enough for kings to indulge in and for scholars to write about it right so it yeah. moves from what may be considered as frivolous to something more serious uh, for chess is very serious like it, yeah. Yeah. yeah it is anyway an international olympic level sport you know it's not an olympic yeah, correct sport, but 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 by when these documents were written in india that was not the case that even though it was international it, there were not tournaments and you you didn't have your uh, corpo caspro uh, vishwanath no. <laughs> etc right uh, so it was not that kind of uh, uh, thingy but see, even then it was certainly considered as very much a cerebral game yes not not something easy that you play uh, for time pass no so therefore it was given that there were strategies that there were complexities that there were millions of uh, possibilities and that it is possible for somebody from a losing what appears to be a losing position to win correct it requires this is written on them that i understand but life is made up of so much more i mean what you have shown and i i would like to sort of mention in passing this um, this game and uh, what skanda purana talks about and what elora beautifully depicts in multiple places but this one that i i, know, I don't remember maybe cave number 21 or 28 i don't remember now which has a beautiful depiction it just uh, that that such ideas of fun games where well, this is certainly a fun game because obviously there is a little bickering that comes into the play and uh, you know uh, the ganas taking sides the uh, nandi bull taking side and it's a fascinating uh, storytelling in uh, skanda purana that such things uh, people were uh, playing for fun if we had had documentation that would have been great yeah so there there see we have to look more seriously the trouble is as i said this victorian morality has impinged our even i might say academic morality so i i think is more of order of modern scholars not looking at it rather than uh with not being documented so as you said the epigraphic evidence is thin but uh, uh you know there is a village near tenali i sorry i forget the name There's a very beautiful inscription of the the and the entire village was donated by Krishna Raja, ah uh, Krishna Devaraya, ah uh-huh, ah uh-huh. for courtier. The courtier was the only job the courtier had was to play chess with Krishna Devaraya. Devaraya, okay. 
that's that's really interesting to uh, learn and he beat him at a game once okay and the king was so happy that this fellow plucked the courage to defeat him that he donated an entire village to this guy fantastic that is the inscription okay that's great so uh, i will uh, try to get hold of it and uh, go through it that's uh, superb uh, there is you know when you are talking about game and inscription uh, mangai ragav is a researcher from tamil nadu and yes they we have found a silambam hero stone in tamil near kanchipuram with pallava inscription so oh, perfect right so that's uh, uh, you know that goes along so again uh, i would like to know what the inscription says and uh, uh, given the fact that it's you know we should take it as pallava period inscription because this being a hero stone it's just the family or the village uh, they have uh, uh, you know written things there must be a silambam exponent and uh, uh, you know what more information we can get out of that would be great yeah uh so i'm over- happy to read that inscription yeah yeah i will uh, i will get hold of it and uh, share share with you so you know overall when we really see that so there's been fascinating uh, presence of this right from from forests in india from the uh, indus valley uh, period onwards that we have found uh, material evidence uh, you know scratchings and uh, actual boards uh, you know broken and or otherwise you also showed that um, sumerian uh, uh, you know a cuneiform uh, a tablet yes uh, can you uh, uh, so that that can you say that that is sort of the oldest description of a game that we have been able to find uh, because that that will be readable interpretable etc yes that that the oldest we have anything in the egyptian uh, you know any writing inside any of uh, pharaoh's uh, place which talks about you know okay. we have one which is the the uh, image that you used in the uh, poster is called the topsy turvy papyrus which describes an imaginary world of complete anarchy where mm-hmm. you see the goat and the lion playing with each other okay probably probably either 58 or 20 ho square is one of those games okay but this is the oldest we know from egyptian written records okay the thing with games also problem is they they carried in the head right okay. you just uh-huh. teach it to your children they teach it to their children it's it's your intangible heritage in a very intangible way there no one feels the need to write these things down okay Similarly, uh, there are there are many other aspects also. Like most recipes are also passed down from family. Yeah, but then the family, and then one person decides that it should be put in, uh, you know, some form, either as a shloka or as later on in paper right. or uh, some kind of a manuscript form, uh, so that you know it just stays for posterity, in a sense. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So uh, coming to you know one uh, other question. you know that in the last 100 years one of the uh, uh, you know uh, completely invented game that uh, did phenomenally well this monopoly uh, uh, you know it's a property game or whatever it is called right with uh, so obviously it is a post uh, money modern economics driven kind of sport have you found anything comparable in any form in the ancient uh, or uh, you know uh, pre modern uh, period so monopoly is actually a game with a patent so it actually has a date of date and place of invention right right so it's a, and of course the patent is now owned by hasbro so they yeah, and sure we also that. know who did that all that no it's a very very modern game so we know extremely that extremely modern yeah uh, a precursor to monopoly see there there are certain you have to do a ludemic analysis of these so okay. it, it goes through square it see if you see the game of that i showed you at vijayana if you see kattam which is our you know the uh, board of where you go round and round the board hmm. yeah you, you go in in monopoly you go round and round the board 
you right. cut them, you go on the outer circle first, then you go on the inner circle and try to reach the inner more circle. Right. But if you see a ludimic analysis, monopoly seems to be a derivative of that. Monopoly is basically that the layers and layers of rules and acquisition and uh, paying, generating Correct. money. So that... various things have been added. See, there is also an influence of card games mm -hmm. because you know monopoly has multiple cards in it, and then there are cash transactions involved. So this is like something that uh, you you know cards card games are more popular in the West compared to board mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a synthesis of many things at once. Okay. But you might say that it is, so there is the game of life, mm -hmm. which precedes it, also an invented game. Okay. And the earliest iteration of the game of life is actually something that looks eerily similar to Snakes and Ladders. Okay. Okay. And Snakes and Ladders has a very long established tradition, which is also an Indian game which originated here. I have left it out because it has a history of its own. My talk will never end. Mm -hmm. But again, it's an Indian game, very much originating within the Indian uh, subcontinent. Okay. And it has very strong religious layers to it. Okay. So, it, for example, in the south, it is played on Shivaratri. Right. Um, it's called Paramabhatam Sopanam. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Right. And uh, every square has pictures of gods and heavens and hells and all that in it. Right, there, right. Are, there are Jaina versions of it. So we probably think that the Jains invented it first and then it was acquired by the Hindus. Mm -hmm. There are Vaishnava versions. There is uh, Shaiva versions. Then there are, you know, there are Islamic versions. There are Jewish versions. There okay. are Victorian Christian versions. Oh, okay. At some point of time, somebody just removed all the religious layers and just turned it into a children's game with snakes and ladders. Okay. And that's the one that we know today. But this is post World War II. Okay. Uh, so again, I think there is a long there is a lot more investigation to be done. One only has 24 hours in a day. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. There is a there's a comment from uh, Dr. Balambar. Yes. Where it is, um, uh, there are no writings in Egypt, but Pallanguri boards are there in pyramids. Oh, yes. Okay. With Pallanguri, we have absolutely no idea where it originated, when it originated. We are seeing Pallanguri boards in the context of the Neolithic period. Wow. Okay. Uh, now, that adds a lot of mystery to where it came from, when it came from. It seems to be uh, <laughs> as old as... If you just go back... Probably the uh, hominids, uh, you know, pre-sapiens, uh, some erectus probably played uh, that kind of a game too. I mean, I don't know uh, how uh, how far back you can go. Yeah, they said one of the traits of games is that they have rules. Hmm. So, playing things with rules is a very, very human thing. Now, when that evolved in the evolution of our species, I don't know. One yeah. of the German scholars has even said that games came first and civilization came second because the notion of playing with rules is something that probably emerged on the game board and then became part of society. Thank you. You know, with, with, uh, On that note, uh, we will uh, end uh, today's uh, Tamil Heritage Trust monthly lecture. I think there's so much that we have learned today. Thank you. And I would like to... Uh, take this little more seriously personally to start exploring, you know, many of the historic sites that we go to, we do see some scratchings, you know, I mean, I mean, I use the word, some scratchings, it's, you know, that's the only value that I have been giving it so far because of the, you know, inability to place a sort of time period on them. So you're going to a site, which is say seventh century, something has been uh, scribbled there. I don't yes. know. 7th century or 13th century or 19th century, uh, you know, it's, and therefore you sort of assign it a lower value, but then in reality, so much has happened and we have fairly authentic evidence. So it may be worthwhile to look at these aspects too. And uh, uh, you have certainly opened up a new world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your My wonderful. colleague, Dhyanish, when he calls this Kelia, that once you've been introduced to this, that virus touches you. 
<laughs> so, you know, you go to a monument, the roof, the, the ceiling is fascinating, the walls right. are fascinating, right. right? But you become, once you've got this Kelia, you become, the first thing that we do now when we go to monuments, we look down. <laughs> Once you've spotted the games and documented them, then we look up and look at the sculptures and the paintings. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. With that, we will end the show today. Thank you to uh, all our uh, viewers from Tamil Heritage Trust. We'll be here again uh, next next month, uh, first Saturday, with another lecture. Thank you all. Bye-bye.